Hello, everyone. Welcome to another coffee chat session for my YouTube channel, Data Science with Sam. Today, I'm joined by a special guest from NASA to talk about uh, space research and NASA in general. With further ado, I'm gonna, it's my pleasure to welcome Kofi Burnham, a rocket scientist and a deputy chief information officer at NASA to this show. Thank you, Kofi, for joining and welcome to the session. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate you taking some time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to dive into our first question. So talking about NASA, I know we all pretty much intrigued about what's going on at NASA. I mean, like it's kind of people are so much interested in space research and they've been following NASA for their entire lives. So I'm pretty sure there are so many viewers out there. They'll be interested to know about your journey. So could you please talk a little bit about your 15 years of NASA journey? I know you can't cover everything in you know, like a few minutes, okay. but try to cover some key points or maybe just provide some insights about how your day-to-day -day work life looks like at NASA. Yeah. So please take it from here. Yeah, I mean, I guess I wouldn't be able to talk a lot about it without going back even far back to when <laughs> I was like 10 yeah. or 12 years old. So I... Um, I always wanted, I was always fascinated by NASA. My parents um, took me and my brothers uh, to the Kennedy Space Center. So the John F. Kennedy Space Center, which is in Florida. And they just, we had a tour and just kind of walked around and I always found myself fascinated about space and NASA in particular. And I don't know, I think that was in my psyche for a little bit. So I really just <laughs> thought like, hey, I love NASA. And then when the opportunity out of college came up to work there, I was, I'm a, uh, trained as a mechanical engineering major. So I got my, my bachelor's from Prairie View a University. And that was kind of the, they came and actually recruited for mechanical engineers. And so that was the start of my NASA journey. I was actually a contractor at that point. And I worked there for a couple of years. Um, then I went to the private sector for a few years. Uh, then somehow I found my way back to NASA again as a uh, a contractor again, but then I became a civil servant. So, um, but I've been in the, uh, I was in the information technology area for a while. So I did that when I was at NASA. And then uh, finally I was in the avionics area um, and robotics in the engineering group. So it's been a um, an awesome opportunity. I mean, I've, I'm, I'm still a space geek. Uh, always will be um, just fascinated about the opportunities in, in at NASA and engineering in general. And, you know, you can't take the engineering out of the kid, I guess. And that's sure. kind of how that's kind of how it goes. So day to day, um, I do a lot in more of kind of the risk management and leadership areas. So a lot of what we do is try to manage risk, control risk. And so it's really about because there's risk in everything, but there's kind of how what's the what's the consequence or likelihood that that risk is actually going to occur usually come up with a mitigation and possibly even a control. So a lot of what I do today is kind of managing that process. Um, and then also the leadership aspect, which is leading a team of, of other engineers. So um, I will say it's probably, we always say at NASA that it's, it's probably sexier on the outside than the inside. <laughs> it's just, it's just another engineering job, but, uh, but you get to do it with a cool, a cool goal of trying to land human beings on the moon and on Mars, so. Yeah, I mean, that's quite a fascinating thing. And I, and I totally agree with you. Maybe it's kind of looks very sexier from outside because, because I mean, I'm just gonna keep the, uh, coin that proverb, you know, grass is greener on the other side, but it's, right. it's looks like as they get the same engineering job that we do in other industry, right? Uh, but yeah, but I think one thing I'm pretty sure our viewers would be very interested to know, like, you know, as you said, from your mechanical engineering background, then you uh, got into NASA and then kind of way uh, up the chain and became a leader and management uh, managers in your NASA job. So, so if somebody like, you know, for an aspiring person who wants to get into NASA, so what will be, what kind of tips or suggestion would you like to provide a person just to get into NASA? I mean, what should they do to build up their skill set so they'll be eligible for an internship or any sort of jobs at NASA? Just yeah, I tell, I tell kids, I mean, I guess I, I would probably answer that in a couple of different yeah. ways. 
if you're a college student, one of the best ways to really get into NASA is through the internship program. Mm-hmm. Um, we're always looking to kind of keep a, a good cycle of um, college graduates coming into the um, into NASA. And so if you're like, it's a really hard program to get into because a lot of people apply. But if you're, um, at, you know, feel like you're up to that, that challenge, um, going through the Pathways intern program is probably one of the better ways to get a, a full-time job after you graduate. So I always recommend that to folks. And you can have all kinds of degrees at that. So you don't need to just be an engineering major. We we have accountants that go through there, people with a business background. Uh, there's people with an HR background. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that folks from an internship program come in. Um, I will say, though, just like any other company or corporation or business, sometimes you need folks that have a little bit more seasoning or experience. And so with that, it's more just kind of just looking at going to you know the website, seeing what jobs you might be interested in. Um, it's really it's really hard to say, like, you need a space background because it's not a lot of companies right. <laughs> it's more now, like with SpaceX and Axiom and uh, uh, some of those companies now. There's a bigger pool, but back when I started, it was pretty much just NASA. That was all. That was all that was out there. So yeah. um, it's hard. It was really hard to find. Even when I, I have hired more experienced people, mm-hmm. you don't really look for somebody with space experience. You just kind of look for somebody with either engineering experience mm-hmm. or IT experience because you can kind of get them up to speed on the on the space part of that. Right. So I don't think if you're experienced as you're really looking for anything special, it's more just. Um, being committed, being, um, you know, having the technical skills and also some of the softer skills as well. True. I mean, I think that's kind of, uh, obviously my viewers will get benefited from this uh, information because a lot of people are kind of interested. Uh, I'm pretty sure they wanted to get into NASA program, but it's kind of the pathway is obviously very stiff. Learning curve would be very stiff, but it's just like having that, uh, you know, <clears throat> that intuition, having that interest to work for NASA would always be the driving factors. I mean, again, you got to be a top notch engineers to work for NASA. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I would say you gotta, you gotta love, and you, I mean, no matter what you're in, you gotta love what you do. True. Um, that should be a factor in anything. So, you know, if you feel like you love the space industry and love. Cause you, you probably won't be doing it for the money. <laughs> so not exactly. to say you're like working for free. Cause that's not, that's definitely not the case. I mean, it's exactly. a definitely a reasonable um, salary is just, you, we always say it at the government level, you won't get rich working for the government. Just, that's just not how <laughs> it's set up. So it is, yeah. <laughs> really kind of balancing. Um, and it's going to get me wrong. They're high tech jobs. So there's a good salary there, but you're really kind of more working for um, a goal. Um, more than anything else. No, thanks, Kofi. It's very informative. I'm pretty sure my viewers will be, uh, you know, they got so much like insights about this and hopefully they'll be motivated more uh, to find a job at NASA after listening to this uh, coffee chat session. So now I'm going to actually dive into the final question for this uh, talk. So, I mean, today, you know, I mean, if I look back if a last couple of decades, technology has been advanced a lot. We are literally uh, feeling ourselves lucky to live in this uh, era where AI, machine learning, and other technological aspects uh, made us so many uh, breakthroughs in in, the, in that space. So if I look, check in the other industry, I've seen so many AI and machine learning and deep learning work have been going on. So now, uh, similar to that, I'm just I'm interested to find out, like in your opinion, like what do you think this AI machine learning would uh, you know make a certain ground breakthrough in the space research industry? which will take not only NASA, even the SpaceX also to the next level of uh, space research. Like we have already been seeing some uh, great work have been going on uh, between NASA and SpaceX and they're collaborating together uh, in the space, uh, the Mars mission and other stuff. So, but I, I just want to hear from a NASA scientist that what do you think about what's the, what would be the applicability of AI machine learning in the space research uh, for the foreseeable future? Yeah, we've looked at it. We've done a lot of um, inside or, research into um, artificial intelligence and machine learning we've actually uh, we actually took a trip out to google i don't i'm, I'm sure you know this but mm-hmm. google is one of the leaders in machine learning i mean they're like yeah. light years ahead of a lot of folks and so we were trying to get up to speed and we we're like well hey let's go and ask the experts so we went out there and um it's for us it's really two challenges one i'll kind of mention this as a as a government organization, 
there's only so much you know we can give from a, uh, yeah. Yeah. From a from salary standpoint. <laughs> so when we try to hire a group, I mean a data scientist or a mm-hmm. data engineer, mm-hmm. uh, they quickly find out they can probably make you know 50, 60, 70 percent more <laughs> okay. uh, working somewhere yeah. else. They're like, uh, thank you, but I'm gonna go over here. So it's a it's a bit of a challenge there. Uh, I mean, obviously that's not that's not the only thing that just makes it a little bit more complicated. The other part about uh, machine learning anyway, is that you do need these massive data lakes. You need a lot of data to be able to fit the curve, to be able to do a lot of the uh, machine learning. Um, yeah. And the space business is kind of a one-off. I mean, there's really, you know, there's there's some like with the space shuttle, we only launched the space shuttle like a hundred times-ish, a hundred times. I mean, that's not a huge number of data points for anything, you know, to be able to try to fit the curve for machine learning and some of the other mm-hmm. things. Now, that being said, we have done some things. So we have a ton of imagery on the ISS, so the National Space Station that's up there right now. Uh, we do a ton of like photo and videos. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that we were doing was we were actually having human beings looking at all that that footage. Now, you could imagine that, you know, like any place, there's probably a lot of downtime. And so, like, there's a lot of video footage where really nothing's happening. And so we would have our human beings, like, marking, like, hey, we need to cut this, cut this. There's really nothing happening here. We can just delete this. One of the projects that we had just started doing was, like, hey, can we just have uh, some kind of machine learning algorithm that can look at the video and say, hey, there's really nothing happening. There's no motion. There's no, there's nothing happening here. We can just mark it and not have an actual human being that would spend time and energy having to look at all that video. Um, That's one. And then um, one guy we just had, so before they go out on EVAs, they wear their gloves. And so they take pictures of the gloves to make sure they don't have holes in them. Mm -hmm. They send those pictures down and have uh, a mission control look at them just to make sure like, hey, there's no, no holes or no cuts or anything like that. And so one of our young engineers wrote a, a machine learning algorithm to do that um, um, via, um, we call it AI, but you know, machine learning. And so he partnered with Microsoft on that. So I know that that's, um, he's gotten some kudos for that, that process as well. So we are starting to get there uh, more so in the imagery area because the imagery, we do take a ton of pictures and video. And so that's been, um, been pretty cool. I mean, no. Uh- it's interesting you said that because I kind of got a little bit of information about this collaboration with Microsoft uh, because uh, I think one time I was browsing through Microsoft site and I found out that they actually did some uh, computer vision algorithm work for Artemis uh, project, you know, like, so they kind of like build kind of an imaginary uh, imagery, like an AI machine, which will kind of classify the moon rocks. Uh, based on like different, uh, uh, I guess, texture, the curvature and all those stuff. So I guess in those areas, we can definitely, uh, you know, get use of AI and machine learning. So a machine would actually help us to uh, classify the image and, you know, give us some prediction or tell us that what kind of, uh, ro- what types of rocks that are or something like that. So yeah, it's fascinating to see that all these tech companies are kind of collaborating with NASA to take us to the next level of AI and machine learning. So yeah. hopefully, uh, we can see more, uh, you know, use cases or applications that have been used by NASA in their space research. Yeah, yeah that's, I think that's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I think it's pretty cool. It's a, it's actually a good opportunity. Again, it's it's not a one to one. I mean, again, it's it's some areas. I think there's some applicability. I know there's a lot of hype for it initially, and I do think that there's there's um, there's definitely some engineering opportunities there. But there's also you have to be careful of some of the the um, the risk when it comes to AI and some of the imagery stuff. And when it comes to who's behind writing the machine learning algorithm, is the algorithm biased? Does it have any? Exactly. There's there's some philosophical things that I think we as engineers need to be careful of when it comes to some of this AI stuff. And I'm not smart enough to be knowing on all of it i just know enough that we have to it's it's almost like any code from a a software programmer the code is only good as the programmer and so you just have to be careful there i mean it's very interesting that you mentioned that because this uh, model bias it's kind of becoming a very like a crucial factor when it comes to ai policy or implementing ai governance in any industry 
I'm, I'm, I'm kind of glad that you know, NASA is also thinking in the same way because that's also going to be a very unforeseeable or forceable challenges in the future because anything could be possible if your model is predicting uh, based on some biased uh, analysis or something like that. So we got to make sure that our model provides some accuracy. It's not about like just getting 99% accuracy. It's also about you know, how that model is behaving towards that pattern. So that's, that's also a big challenge in the AI world. And I'm glad that NASA is also kind of uh, uh, putting a lot of importance. To well, that. we're aware of it. We're aware. I, w- I don't want to make it over overdo it, but we are aware of it, that it is a bias. But, you know, it's like a lot of things. Yeah. You don't know it's a bias until until maybe after. It's an unintentional exactly. bias, right? It's not like it's a you, you don't go into it trying to be biased. You just figure out, oh, oops, we were, you know, we we didn't account for for X, Y, and Z. It's a lot of variabilities. Yeah. 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 True. Well, that's that's good to know. And uh, uh, thanks, Kofi, for sharing some of the insights about how NASA or maybe in space research in general get might get benefited by AI machine learning bearing all this AI policy and governance issue taken into consideration of my end of the foreseeable future. So I think that's all. I mean, I kind of like getting to the end of this discussion. So anything else you want to talk about or anything specific to talk about for my viewers before we wrap up this call? Uh, I, I mean, it, uh, just machine learning, I think is awesome. Hopefully that's coming across. Um, I think the practicality of it and having it actually be something that you use, I think in different areas, it's, it's, it's an awesome tool. Um, in space, it's like I said, kind of a one-off where there's not a huge um, data lake that's coming, hopefully at some point, um, with some of the commercial vendors. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm I remain fascinated by the by the tech. I've I've tried to apply it in different areas. I've tried to do some machine learning algorithms and stuff like that myself, and kind of more personally. And uh, it's fascinating to me, and I can definitely see the 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 math and how how it works. So I I, I remain fascinated by it, and and hopefully um, at some point, you know, we can get something um, really tangible out of the out of the science. Yeah, true. I mean, like I feel like I know AI and machine learning can do some wonder, but we still need that human oversight. So I guess like other industry, it will be still like a human driven AI will have maybe the <clears throat> better impact on and space research or any kind of stuff NASA would do. We, I mean, we still can't eradicate that uh, manual intervention factor from it. And we still need a human to make better judgment. We can't just rely on AI and machine learning on that. Uh, if I remember right, um, Google, when we went out there, they are actually seeing like tangible results. But I mean, mm-hmm. Google has like, you know, how many billions of users and, you know, they have a lot of, lot of applications, but I, and this number for some reason is in my head and it might be wrong, but for some reason I was thinking like they have 5,000 machine learning algorithms, like total that they use. Yeah. like they they, yeah. 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 Um, And it's just fascinating to me that they're able to, uh, to get that level of, um, of impact, I guess. Yeah. And so I'm fascinated by that, that they're that, um, they're that cool with it. So yeah, I mean, I mean, again, it's, it's awesome. Yeah, Google has been doing a, they're actually now, I guess, <clears throat> they're running a project to consolidate all those models into an auto ML platform. So they don't even need a data scientist like us in future. And anybody, uh, even without having a prior data science or machine learning knowledge, can go into auto ML and just, uh, you know, just feed the data and run model. They don't need to be a data scientist or machine learning. So Google is also trying to build an auto ML platform for their end users. So people without data science skills that would also be able to run their models. Um, hey, so um, and I'll let you go, but did you see the story about, was it a Google engineer that had talked about like the some, some AI? AI had yeah. came alive and started responding? Yeah. <laughs> He's so like, it's you. It's it's policy and governance coming to factor, right? And I'm from a financial services industry and like yeah. I could also understand the factor because when you talk about money or you know some sensitive matters, <laughs> yeah. So, but I didn't actually know m- much about it. But uh, do you, did you know anything about that? What exactly happened? That literally. I thought he was it? doing a bot, and he was talking to it, and then it all of a sudden took consciousness. And I might be getting it wrong, but it was something on the order of magnitude. Like it actually, whatever res- response came back, it was responsive. Like like. The, like almost the AI had a consciousness. Consciousness, of it. yeah. And so he put it on, um, put it on, I don't know like how he put it on. Machina, the that movie, it. right? <laughs> yeah, maybe he tweeted it. And then Google was like, no, it did not come. It was just, I, as an engineer and a geek, I kind of was like, wait, it, it was funny, but it was also interesting 
but I can also see from Google side because you know everybody starts thinking about Terminator and Skybot, Skynet. Exactly. Skynet. And, we don't want them to outsmart us. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if yeah. you're a Matrix fan, the robots <laughs> taking over and all that stuff. Exactly. So anyway, I, uh, I because that will be that's we don't want that kind of a Terminator Judgment Day. I mean, because right. we, that's why we still need. Uh, I think the human driven AI is kind of like an answer for now. Unless until we figure out how we can make sure that the AI and uh, any robots will not outsmart us, right. uh, because I think I think that's the way to go, and I think that's kind of universal in any industry, not even in NASA. I think in other industries also, we might need to have that human judgment and human expertise. Like we can't just rely on any machine learning and AI to full extent, you know, until we are fully satisfied with the you know accuracy or any sort of like performance. Yeah, sure. technology is neither bad nor good; it's how human beings True. apply it. I mean, that's, yeah. that's my fundamental, one of my, I forgot who said it, I got to Google it, but um, I remember that's my fundamental thought whenever it comes to technology. Technology is not bad or good. It's just how human beings elect to apply it and use it. So it's really exactly. us, the technology. Yeah, we are the driver. I mean, we got to figure out how we do it. <laughs> uh, anyway, it was a pleasure talking to Kofi. Uh, thanks for your time. I'm pretty sure my viewers will get a lot of information, especially it's related to NASA or space research on how I know the, all these space research industries are implementing AI and machine learning in their current work. So thanks for your time, Coffee, once again. And um, that's all for now. And to my viewers, please keep following my YouTube channel and subscribe to that because there'll be more Coffee Chat sessions featuring industry experts and research scientists will be forthcoming soon. Thank you. Thanks, Coffee. Thank you for having me.